And we'll do a quick agenda for the day and we'll get started. So we're going to do presentations on um, several different areas of law that uh, you'll need to know about when starting your food business. Of course, there are more, and your handbook's going to be a lot more detailed than our presentations. These are kind of rapid fire presentations that we're going to be giving you today. After that, we have some advisors from different um, county agencies and local nonprofits that work with food businesses um, on incubation, uh, financing, and business development. And so the second half of the workshop for about an hour will be kind of informal group discussions um, that you guys will you know, take your questions about your particular business idea or your business and ask them. So if you have a planning question, you can talk to the planning person. Um, and the idea is for sort of each of us to, to learn from each other. Um, so you might have a similar question to someone else, so if you sit in a group and have a conversation, then you guys might learn a lot more together. Um, and that'll go from about, let's see, 11.30 to 12.30, and that'll be the, the workshop for the day. So um, without further ado, let's start the presentations. Press the button. And Aaron is first. Right. I don't know. Wow. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming down on a, on a cold and rainy morning. But uh, I think the sun is, is coming out a bit, so. Things are looking up. My name is Aaron Boyd. I'm a, a first year student at Berkeley Law. And I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about forming a business entity. Um, many of you are, are currently running a business or looking to start a business or interact with um, food justice businesses in some capacity. Um, and I hope to give you a little bit of an idea of the different um, formations and entities that are out there and, and the benefits and some of the drawbacks of, of the various kinds. So these are an example of some of the different formations. Um, I'm sure you recognize uh, a, a few of these, whether it's uh, a partnership or an LLC, a cooperative, a nonprofit. Um, we'll get into to each one of these during the presentation. Um, but before we get into the specific types of formation, there, there's a few questions that one should uh, ask his or herself about uh, what are your needs and goals in, in forming a business entity. Um, and the first one could be who will own the business? Uh, is it going to be you as a, as a private individual? Are you going to have partners? May nobody own the business, it's a nonprofit. Um, but it's a good idea to have that in mind when approaching forming a business entity. Um, another question is how will the business be managed? Are you going to be the owner and operator? Are you going to have other employees? Are you going to have a board and a management structure? Um, these are questions that impact your decision around a business formation as well. Um, should the business pay taxes separately from you? Um, depending on what type of formation you choose, uh, that will impact the way that you pay taxes. And uh, to not piss off the IRS, it's important to, to uh, make sure you're, you're on the right page with that one. Um, and lastly, do you want to be protected from liability? And if so, to what degree? Um, and the, your level of protection from liability um, goes along with some other uh, benefits and, and drawbacks with these business entities and, and we'll point that out in the next uh, coming slides. So let's lead it right off with sole proprietorships and partnerships. This is the default formation for a business if the owner hasn't filed anything. Um, and the difference is a sole proprietorship is one owner and a partnership is two or more owners. Um, and the pros are that it's easy to set up because you don't have to file anything. Um, there's no additional annual fees that come along each year. And uh, you have a lot of organizational freedom, unlike other business entities like a uh, corporation that comes along with uh, structural requirements like a board of directors and, and record keeping and all that sort of stuff. Um, but there are some cons, and one of it is that it's, it's higher risk because you're personally liable for the operations of the business. So for example, if you're running a food truck, and one of your customers gets food poisoning and decides to sue uh, your business, you may be personally liable from your home and your savings on the damages that result from, from that lawsuit. Um, so as you can see here, the profits pass directly through the business to the individual owner. It's not taxed at the business level, but the liability also passes directly through to the business owner. And for that reason, 
it's good to get insurance when you're running a sole proprietorship or a partnership to protect you from some of the liability that comes along with that. <coughs> Next, we have a limited liability company, an LLC. And the reason why it's called limited liability is because it shields you from some of that liability we just discussed. Um, so that although your stake in the company is at risk, your financial stake in the company, your personal savings and home aren't necessarily at risk um, by the operations of, of your business. Um, and like a uh, sole proprietorship and partnership, the profits pass through directly to the owner. They're not taxed at the business level. Um, and this is a very popular uh, form for small businesses that includes an $800 annual fee. So that's definitely something to keep in mind as well. Next we have corporations where the owners are the shareholders and your voice in the company corresponds to your financial stake in the company. So if you have 25% stake in that company, you get 25% of the profits from that company and in decision making you have 25% of the voice. Um, so some of the pros are, are like an LLC, you're, you're protected from, from some liability and it's also easier to get loans and raise investment money. So if you're trying to raise capital, this could possibly be an, an attractive option for you. Um, but the cons are that it can be complicated. They're more regulated and so you have uh, requirements as to the structure of the business and the management that goes along with that. And you're taxed both at the business level and then also for your personal income. Uh, and there's also the $800 uh, annual fee that, that is uh, with corporations and LLCs. Next we have nonprofits. Um, if you're looking to get donations from the public at large, this might be an attractive formation for you because these donations are tax deductible. Um, but there's no owners of a nonprofit. So if you're looking to extract profits personally from your business, uh, the nonprofit may not be for you. You can take a salary, but you can't take the profits of that formation and, and take that personally. Uh, and we have cooperative corporations, cooperatives as, as we call them, and Janelle's gonna get uh, much more deeply into exactly uh, what are cooperatives and, and how they function, but I'll give just a, a brief overview. Um, there are different kinds of cooperatives. Two prominent ones are consumer owned, like REI, where the customers are also the owners. Um, and another is worker owned, like Rainbow Grocery, where the workers are the owners. Um, but either way, a prominent feature of a cooperative is that it's one member, one vote. So unlike a corporation where it depends on the financial stake that you have in the business, with a cooperative, the highest up employee has the same voice in decision making as the employee that was newly hired. Um, and unlike uh, corporations, uh, the cooperative, the taxes pass directly through, uh, you're only taxed at the personal income level, not at the business level. And there are different ways for profit distribution, and I think Janelle's gonna, gonna tell you a little bit about that as well. Um, so there are some resources, some free resources uh, that are listed on page four of your handbook. I just want to point one specific, or two out to you. One is the, the filing. So now that you know a little bit about, uh, right, you may have come uh, uh, with some knowledge about business formations, you can go to the California Secretary of State website and there are step-by-step -step guides about how you can actually file for these business formations. Um, and then there are various books and business counselors and legal services uh, available to entrepreneurs that are looking to start a business or have legal questions. Uh, the one that I'll point out is the Sustainable Economies Law Center Legal Cafe which happens three times a month in the East Bay, and it's a one-time consultation with lawyers um, that can help answer some of your legal questions around your business. I mean, it's also a great time to connect with other community members that are looking to form or are running similar businesses, and there are many resources there, like the books that you'll see in the back of the room, and um, individuals that can really offer some, some valuable advice. Uh, so with that in mind, I will pass it to Janelle, I believe, to present on cooperatives. Um, corp cooperatives. <laughs> cooperatives. Also known as cooperatives. <laughs> so I'm in the Sustainable Economies Law Center and part of part of building economies that we feel like will sustain people in the long term um, is really promoting uh, the idea that businesses should be formed as cooperatives. And one reason that is is because if you look at 
a lot of the food that we already eat in society and then you try to figure out who owns it, like what companies own all these, it turns out it's not 14 different companies. In this case, it's just two different companies. And, and businesses, um, you know, no matter what kind of intention they have to stay small or just remain community-based businesses, are very prone to getting swallowed up by larger and larger businesses over time. So even if you start a small bakery, if you're very successful, there's always the temptation to just sell out. And then, then things get very centralized. And, and just to kind of describe it another way, like how, how are the legal structures of our businesses set up uh, to feed us? Well, in a conventional <laughs> business structure, you have, this is a bread, like a grain. So you have all these inputs, you like water, land, seeds, and all of that, and then you have workers doing work, consumers putting in money, you sprinkle on a little pesticide, and then you have the shareholder elected board, so the people who put in the money for the business, who are basically behind the wheels steering the company, and they're steering it so that they can make money. Um, and the reason why this has been the predominant business model for so long is because it conveniently, well, for them, it, you know, people got a lot of money and power, but on the other end, people got jobs and food, and people need jobs and food for the most part. So we've kind of been okay with this, but you know, we have all these huge food companies that even if they make half a billion dollars in profits per year, uh, still might not pay more than minimum wage, they might not provide sick time. So the system is really set up to sort of take as much from workers and to take as much from the system as possible. Um, and that's kind of problematic, and it gets kind of imbalanced. This is the distribution of wealth in our society. Uh, the top 20% of people control 93% of the wealth. So, so we just need to change a couple little things about this business model, and then we're going to be fine. So we change who's in control and who's getting the money. Uh, and this is where cooperatives come in, because in a cooperative, who is in control? It's often a board of directors, but it's a board that's elected by the members of the cooperative. And so it could be elected by the workers, if it's a worker-owned cooperative, uh, by the consumers of the food, if it's a consumer-owned cooperative. And they get the profits. So if there are, if there are um, profits left over at the end of the year, it's funneled back to the workers or the consumers or both on the basis of their patronage. And patronage is kind of a funny word, but you'll hear it a lot with regard to cooperatives. Uh, for a consumer, somebody who's like buying bread, it refers to how much bread they bought, how much money they paid to buy bread. For the worker, it often refers to the value of work they did or the number of hours of work they did. So, so people are not getting paid based on the money they had the privilege to invest. It's based on the purchases they made or the work that they did. And one thing to dispel about cooperatives is a lot of people think cooperatives are this. It's like people having long meetings and getting really frustrated and taking forever to, to do everything. And it's true that some cooperatives are like that, but so are a lot of organizations. So you can just kind of boil cooperatives down to two really important things that make them, legally speaking, completely different from conventional business. One is that money doesn't buy power in a cooperative, and money doesn't buy profits because it's a one member, one vote basis, it's a democratic organization, and you distribute the profits based on how much people work or how much people buy, not how much they invest. So money doesn't control everything for cooperatives. <coughs> people control everything in cooperatives. So, yeah, let's play, what kind of bread cooperative is it? Because if you say, well, I'm gonna form a bread cooperative, that can mean a few different things. If it means, that you're gonna start a bakery and all the people in the bakery are gonna be members of the cooperative. What kind of cooperative is that? Workers cooperative. If you're going to start a company that buys bread from lots of home-based bakers, because it is legal to bake bread in your home and sell it now in California, um, what if you're gonna buy bread from lots of different independent bread bakers and help sell it for them? And those bread bakers own the cooperative. What's that called? Producer. Producer cooperative. Or I've started calling it sometimes freelancer cooperative. So you have a lot of freelance bread bakers, you could say, and they all kind of get together and say, we'll do a lot better, we'll be able to compete better if we get our bread together and market it together. Uh, and if you have a bakery and it is owned and operated by the people who eat the bread, or maybe Maybe it's not a bakery, but people who get together and use their buying power to buy bread together. What do you call that? There you go. 
Yeah. So yeah, it really what it what kind of cooperative is it is just depends on the relationship of the members to the cooperative. And what is it that the cooperative is doing for them? Because you know the cooperative is there to serve the members. And then the way that you distribute patronage or the profits for worker cooperatives based on hours work for a producer or freelancer cooperative, it's all often the value of the bread that you sell and provide to the cooperative. And for a consumer cooperative, it's the value of the bread that you buy. And sometimes you can mix them all together and have a cooperative that's owned by all three, which is pretty fabulous, sometimes complicated, but doable, um, legally speaking. So cooperatives in California um, have usually just two entities that they choose from. Um, you, there are definitely other options. Eric was saying, there's a lot of different types of entities, and many of them are flexible to the point where you could basically adapt any entity to feel like a cooperative. But there is a type of corporation in California that's designed just for cooperatives, called a consumer cooperative corporation. Don't, don't pay any attention to that word, because you can use that type of corporation to form a worker cooperative or a producer cooperative, um, as well as a consumer cooperative. A lot of cooperatives form as LLCs, and there's a few reasons they do that. Sometimes if you know you're going to have losses in the first year or two, there's some tax benefits to doing it that way. Um, LLCs are flexible, so if you really want to get creative with how you structure your business, you can do that, whereas the consumer cooperative corporations have more guidelines about how you manage governance and so on. Um, and then a lot of times people don't want to treat themselves as employees because a lot of um, additional legal hurdles kick in when you have to treat yourself like an employee. Uh, and legally speaking, it's a little safer to have an LLC operated as a cooperative and argue that you're not employees than it would be if you were a consumer cooperation. Um, probably more detail that I'm going to get into, but um, what else? In sum, Cooperatives are going to change the way that wealth flows in society because the 80% of people in society who are really just controlling 7% of the wealth, when the money flows around and it cycles and recycles in the community, it grows that, the wealth on that side. So remember the old type of business model that's basically designed to extract as much as possible, compare it to a cooperative that's basically just designed to provide as much as it can for its members. There's really no other point in operating other than to provide whether it's food or jobs, <coughs> but to provide for members. So. so I forgot to look at the time when I started. You know? Yeah. Have I been talking for seven minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Another topic, yeah. employment law. So, um, yes, employment law. Why is it really important? Well, so we have employment laws because the majority of people in the society make their livelihoods by working for other people or other companies. And because we are economically dependent on our employers, it puts us in kind of a vulnerable, vulnerable position. So we have all these laws that are just designed to protect us, make sure that we don't work too many hours, make sure that we have safe working conditions, that we get a minimum wage. So they're very important laws. However, when you're just starting a business, it's very common to break these laws. It's so easy to break these laws. And the other important thing to know about employment laws is it's one of the areas of law where the, the consequences are really, really harsh. Like we were recently contacted by a food-related business that was getting fined $250,000 for what we thought was kind of a minor violation or mix-up. So, um, so you don't want to break these laws. Uh, and you have a couple options. You could create an entity where you, or operate in a way that avoids creating any employment relationship, or you can comply with the laws. So. So there are different ways to have people work for your business and not have them be considered employees. But for a food business, what I would advise is always assume that anybody working is an employee. Start with that assumption because the thing about food is it's very controlled. It has to happen in a certain way at a certain time. And um, it's kind of hard to say that people are able to just like do it on their own time, like independent contractors and so on. So I'll describe what some of these are. But the, the first one I'll just say is a business partner. Like if you do start a business with one other person, or you start a cooperative with five people, you form it as an LLC, and you all manage it together, and you're all sharing in the profits and losses, arguably you're all business partners, and you don't have to treat yourselves like employees. But definitely get a lawyer to advise you if you're going to go with that argument. 
Okay, but other options for having people work for your business and not be considered employees, if they are independent contractors, I mean, probably a lot of us have had jobs, quote unquote jobs, where at the end of the year we get a 1099 miscellaneous form, which generally means we're an independent contractor for whoever we were working for. Um, but it's very easy to misclassify people. So independent contractors are people who are truly independent, meaning they control their working conditions, they tend to set their own hours, they kind of set the standards of how things are done, use their own tools, they might work for a lot of different people. So uh, a lawyer, for example, is an independent contractor when a lawyer works for lots of different businesses. Uh, an electrician, um, a lot of people who just come in for a one-time job and fix things or set things up, you know, web designer. But somebody who is making food, in almost all cases, you want to treat them like an employee because, I, as I said, food is such a controlled uh, work environment. So it's very hard to argue that anybody who's either farming or making food is an independent contractor. Um, business and not be considered an employee, uh, it's very limited, but in some cases people can be considered volunteers. But this is the legal definition of volunteer, which is somebody who is working without any expectation of pay, and they're doing it for humanitarian, public service, or religious purposes, or charitable purposes. So if you're just a regular business, it's very hard to argue that anybody working for your business is a volunteer. Because um, it's a business, they're working for you. Um, if you have a separate project or if you farm as a 501c3 nonprofit, then it's a little bit easier to say, okay, people are doing this because um, you know, they're doing it for humanitarian purposes. But um, here's an example. You recognize that person? John Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. Anyways, he's all grown up now. And he started a restaurant in New Jersey and he has people come in and quote unquote volunteer, but they get these food certificates in exchange. And then they can use these food certificates to buy meals. I'm surprised he hasn't been busted for it because basically people are volunteering and or you could say they're getting paid, but they're not getting paid in dollars and minimum wage has to be paid in dollars. So don't do that. Um, you can have interns, but pay very close attention to what an intern is. So an intern is there to learn. They're there all for themselves and not for you. And in fact, ideally they might even be a bit of a burden to you because you're there to teach them, provide them skills and opportunities. So interns should not displace regular employees, so they shouldn't you know, come in and do things that employees regularly do, or they shouldn't do it very much. Um, the employer really shouldn't benefit from having an intern and maybe even sometimes be burdened or impeded by having an intern. So if an intern isn't a little annoying and burdensome, you should, you know, maybe try doing something different with them, create some curriculum for them, um, you know, do whatever it takes to ensure that it's all about their learning experience and not about benefiting your business. So, if you do have employees, which in many cases, as I mentioned, you will, you have obligations to the employee and to the government. So the employee, you have to pay minimum wage. There's San Francisco's current minimum wage, I think, 1074. Um, and of course, it's going to start going up. And um, so each year it's going to change. Uh, you have to pay overtime, and that's based on. Maybe I'm going to slide about that. Um, yeah, you have to pay overtime. You can't let people work more than a certain number of hours in a day or a certain number of days per week. You have to make sure that they have breaks, um, that they have lunch breaks. Uh, except if somebody is an exempt employee. So exempt employees are people who get salaries. The salaries have to be twice minimum wage at the very least. And they tend to be administrative employees or professional employees. But you don't want to misclassify people. So this is another situation where it's, it's safest to assume that people are non-exempt, meaning you have to comply with the hours and breaks laws. Um, so you also need to make sure the working conditions are safe. You need to have an injury prevention plan, which our organization just realized we didn't have one, so we made one, even though all we do is you know, type on our computers all day and give the occasional workshop. Um, but other areas of work, like food production, people do get injured pretty commonly. So you want to take a lot of precautions and actually have a plan uh, to prevent injury, and specific to the food industry. So what are the unique risks in your industry? You need to post signs 
in the workplace so that people can, on their breaks, hopefully read the tiny print and know what their rights are. Um, you need to, this, these are obligations to the government also, you need to register with the California em Employment Development Department. Uh, you need to verify people's eligibility to work in the United States by having to fill out an I-9 form. Uh, you have to pay payroll taxes to the state and federal government. Um, yeah. Now again, if you are able to create a business where people are not employees, where they're all owners, for example, you don't have to do these things. But assume <coughs> that you do. You have to have workers' compensation insurance, no matter how many employees you have or how much they work. Uh, it's important to get this, and it does tend to be more expensive in food-related industries, which is another sort of benefit to being a cooperative where people are not employees. I know some cooperatives decide not to get workers' comp, and then they instead invest in really good health insurance for themselves, and disability insurance. Mm -hmm. But for an employee, you have to have it, and of course you have to have them repeat, uh, report their illness, uh, their injuries, you have to keep records of the injuries. I didn't make these slides, but just, yeah. In summary, you have a lot of things to do, but once you get in the habit of it, it's not that hard. It's just at the very outset, make sure you dedicate some time to learning these things. There's uh, some information in the book about it. Oh, and if you want to learn more about cooperatives, and you go to our web website, theself.org, we have a whole other book called Think Outside the Box, which is just about worker-owned cooperatives. And then we have on our YouTube channel a whole lot of workshops that we've taught about working cooperatives. And we have a lot of co-op related discussions at our legal cafes. So definitely think about going to our legal cafes. All right, thanks. Awesome. Actually, there are a couple of copies of the Think Outside the Boss Manual back on that table where the sort of resources are. So if you want to take a look at it um, in hard copy, they're back there. Can we ask questions or should we save them for the end? If you want to have a question, if you have a question about cooperatives or employment law, um, after this we're going to have sort of the casual um, conversation portion, so you can ask that question, and Janelle is going to be available. We're all going to be available to answer the question. Um, so after you formed your entity and you want to start and hired employees, or maybe you haven't, you formed a cooperative, um, you're going to need to do a few routine business sort of licensing and permitting things. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, three things that you're going to do. Um, one is a, a permit from the city, one is from the county, and one is from the state that you're probably going to need. Uh, so the first is getting a name. Um, and just by the way, this is all on the handbook. Um, so if you're not going to be doing business, as your legal name, then you're going to need to file what's called a fictitious business name statement um, with the county. Um, and so the first, you have to pick a name, which is the fun part. Uh, and then second, you file the, the statement. And two and third, you need to um, publish it in a newspaper of general circulation um, for four weeks, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. So first, um, search online on the county's website uh, to make sure that the name is not already taken. So say I wanted to uh, start a business called Neil's Rum Cakes. Um, if I'm not going to call it Neil Popper, I'm going to call it Neil's Rum Cakes and then you file it because you just say that statement. As well, if I've created a, a legal entity, if I have an LLC <coughs> called the Cake King, but I don't like that name as my actual business name, that's going to be sort of facing the public. And I want to call it Neil's Rum Cakes, I have to file a fictitious business name statement. Um, second part is to actually file a form, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and you submit it to the county clerk, it's $47 per name that you register. So if you register um, two names, one for my, myself and one for the Cake King, then um, it's two, two forms. And then third, you need to publish the notice within 30 days of filing um, in a newspaper. And it has to run once a week for four weeks. And then after that, you need to file an affidavit, which all sounds um, kind of complicated. But actually, if you contact, uh, there's a list on the website. And if you just contact any local newspaper, like I think San Francisco Bay Guardian does the whole thing for you for $65. And they'll file the affidavit for you, too. So. Um, it's really routine for them to do it all the time. 
Uh, the second thing you're going to do, um, which is with the city, so that was with the county, this will be with the city, is to get your business license. And in San Francisco, it's called um, business registration. And you need one for every place of business, so every location that you have, you need a business license. And say you go out and you expand to somewhere in Oakland, you'll need to then get um, a business license from the city of Oakland as well. Um, and it's basically how the city can keep track of you and then um, tax you. So it costs $76 to start in, in San Francisco. And I found that the easiest way to find it is just to search San Francisco business registration because the URL is, is kind of um, long and not, it's not great to put on the slide. So just Google search that or use whatever search engine you want to use. Um, and you can submit it in person or via mail. This is $76 to start, I say, because if you have gross revenues over $100,000, so hopefully you all will in the future, um, the registration um, annually increases. And you need to re-register, or sorry, re renew your registration every year before May 31st um, in San Francisco. And then the third thing that you're going to need to do is get a seller's permit. And the seller's permit is issued by the State Board of Equalization uh, and it's so that they can keep track of, of sales tax that you may need to charge on the food that you serve. Um, so if you're engaged in business in California and you sell tangible personal property ordinarily subject to sales tax, you have to charge um, tax and get a seller's permit. So what is that property? And with food, it varies. Um, generally speaking, if it's served hot, and if you're serving it for people to eat at the location, you'll need to charge tax. Um, and if people take packaged food to go, you generally don't. But that's a very general rule, and there are exemptions. And so the Board of Equalization has a few publications. Um, those are the numbers, and there are uh, links, I believe, to them in your handbook on page 40 that sort of detail out whether or not you're going to need to sell, uh, get a seller's permit and charge sales tax. Uh, the good thing is this one doesn't have a cost. It's uh, generally free and you can apply for it online. And then when you're done, if you do have to charge sales tax, you just report it online. Uh, so just to recap. Uh, you need a state seller's permit, which we just talked about, a fictitious business name statement from the county, and then a business license from the city. Okay, so I'm going to talk about health and safety. Um, so after you've filed all that and um, you have your business license, you're ready to go. Not really. We're going to get more permits from um, the, the county this time. So the, the health and safety um, permits are in San Francisco issued by the County Department of Public Health um, and they, their environmental health program. Um, and actually Sandra Ramos is here from the, the county to answer any questions later on if you have any. Um, so I'll just give an overview of the certifications that you need and the permits that you will need and you can ask detailed questions later. So two things are to get certified and to get a permit. Um, the certifications are a food safety certificate for anybody that is the owner or the operator or is overseeing food safety for the business. So anybody that oversees food safety, at least one person needs to have a food safety certificate. And then any employee that is handling food We'll have to get a food handler's card. And the second thing, so there are two, di two different things, certifications and then permits. So the certifications are on the last slide. And um, the permit is a permit from the Department of Public Health to operate. And it depends on whether or not you're a restaurant, um, what's called a temporary food facility, so a food truck or a food vending <coughs> card, or if you're selling at a farmer's market perhaps. Um, or if you're a cottage food operator, so if you're making food in your home to sell. So I'll talk about the certifications first and then a little bit about the permits. Um, so if you're a restaurant, the certification you're going to need for the operator or whoever's overseeing food safety to get the certification, and that's a sort of longer course that you take. It's a one-day course and then there's an exam at the end. 
I believe it costs $143 in San Francisco to, to do that. Um, and then employees will have to get a food handler card uh, if they're handling food at all. And that is $15 per employee. So the permit that you need to get is called a permit to operate. And you first file an application, and there's several parts to, to the application you'll see on the website. Um, and once you file that, then the health inspector will set up an inspection of your facility uh, before, the, before they issue the, the permit. Um, and the fee, I can't remember off the top of my head what the fee is for that. 589. Can you say 589. Okay. Does that include the inspection? Yes. And that includes the, the inspection cost. Um, to get the file, the permit to operate. Uh, one thing that you'll need to know here is you'll have to get your um, business registration before you do this because that's one of the requirements for this application, but we've already covered that, so you probably already have gotten that, but just know that you need to have that in order. Um, here's a few things that they're gonna look for. Um, during the inspection, of course, there's a longer list than this. These are just a few. Uh, things that they're, they're going to be looking for, and that full list is on their, on their website. There's a great uh, flow chart as well of kind of how the permitting process works. So if you're a temporary food facility, what is that? It's defined as um, anybody that is selling or giving away food in one location for a particular amount of time, which can't be more than 25 days in a three-month period. So. What that means is if you're, if you're basically a food truck or selling at a farmer's market um, seasonally um, or another kind of sort of mobile food vending um, facility. So the certifications are the same for this one as before. And the permit's a little bit different. Um, there's two applications. One that you, as the operator of the temporary food facility, are responsible for. And then one that the sponsor of the event that you're selling at is responsible for. And so the sponsor is responsible for gathering everything together and submitting it to the department. But you have this one um, application that you need to be on top of. And there's a deadline of two weeks before the event to file that if you want to avoid, I think, a 50% um, like excess fee for, you know, for filing it too late. So. Um, if you're thinking about selling, say, at a farmer's market, then you're going to want to talk to the farmer's market manager well in advance to make sure that you have that all together. Uh, a couple of things that they're going to look for in the application for temporary food facilities. And um, how many people here are <clears throat> interested in making food at home and selling it? Great. So, um, so as of 2012, when the California Homemade Food Act passed, uh, people are allowed to, to make and sell certain foods uh, from their home kitchens. And so this is the certification process and permitting process for them. It's a little less extensive uh, than <coughs> restaurants and temporary food facilities. So you'll need a food handler card, and then also take, to take a cottage food course, which is administered by the Department of Public Health. This is the State Department of Public Health. So you need to do this within three months of um, getting your cottage food registration. And uh, there's two different types of permits, uh, depending on whether you're going to be doing just direct sales or whether you're going to be doing indirect sales. So direct sales is where you're selling directly to the customer, you're handing it to them. Indirect sales is when you're um, packaging your food and selling it, say, at a local retail store or a local coffee shop, and they're selling it. So if you're selling it yourself, then <clears throat> there's no inspection, but you need to report that your kitchen is meets the standards um, that, they, that the Department of Health requires. But if you're selling indirectly, then there will be an annual inspection. Uh, just be aware that if ever a consumer uh, or a customer complains, then you can be inspected in either class. Um, and a couple things that they're going to require for you to self-certify or to look for in the inspection. The one that I would um, keep in mind is that you can't do two things at once in the kitchen. So if you're making food for your family, uh, you can't also be making, you know, the 
kale chips or whatever it is that you're making for your business. They have to be done at different times. Um, and a few resources. <coughs> uh, the Department of Public Health is going to be your, your best resource um, to help you through this process. If you have a lot of time on your hands, you can read the California Retail Food Code. Um, I don't recommend it, but, but it's there, which is where most of this comes from. Uh, so, just to recap, you get certified, there's a food safety certificate, food handler's card, and then in addition to that, you got to get the right permit. So that's it. <laughs>
So when I clicked on those, I saw that the major difference is that a limited restaurant can't serve alcohol. Um, in a restaurant, you could, and that's probably why there's other kind of rules you have to think about if you're going to do that. <clears throat> so you also have to look at um, the rules governing the facility in that area. So in this case, there's different rules about whether you can have outdoor seating or whether you can have a drive-up, a drive-through restaurant. Um, basically here it says that an outdoor activity area, so like outdoor seating in a restaurant, is permitted if it's in front, but you have to get a conditional use permit if you're going to have it like in the back. Um, so these are other things you need to think about. So sfplanning.org is the San Francisco Planning Department's website, and if you go to Permits and Zoning and then Find My Zoning, they have a lot of information that's very useful, pretty easy to navigate, so I recommend that. Um, you can also go to their office, and this is the address and the phone number, um, and people will be able to help you identify what's permitted or not permitted in the area that you're thinking about starting your business. Also on that website, um, there's a link to what's called San Francisco Property Information Map, and you can plug in your address, and it'll, it'll give you the zoning information for that location. So that might be a little easier than sifting through the, the zoning map and the planning code. <clears throat> you can also call or talk to, um, go visit the, the planning department. We also have somebody, Lisa Chen, I think is here, yes, in the back, um, who can talk to you about your questions. So to recap, the four basic steps are to identify the location where you're thinking about starting your business, even if it's your own house. Um, check the zoning map and planning code to see what's permitted, conditionally permitted, or prohibited, or ask the planning department those questions, and then apply for any necessary permits, especially if you need a conditional use permit for your activity. Sounds very frightening, but it's really just about reducing your risks. Um, so to that end, this is going to be a very bird's eye overview. Uh, there are pages 42 through 45, which will give you some more detail in the handbook. It's an overview of liability, insurance, and risk management. And to that end, we're going to quickly discuss risk management and why it's so important, types of insurance you should be aware of, and how to save money while doing all of this. Thank you. So why worry? So you might be thinking to yourself, I'm a safe person, my facilities are clean, I would never harm anybody. <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as road trip in my place, dangerous fares or electrical hazards, but even if you're the most careful person, accidents happen, and when they do, you can get sued. And even if at the end of the process you're completely innocent, proven innocent, you might actually just be completely depleted of resources uh, just fighting that fight um, for the attorney's fees. So you really need to be insured. Um, you'll also see in the coming slides uh, like something like workers' comp is required by law. Uh, so that brings us to types of insurance. Um, what kind of insurance you need uh, will really depend on your business. Here are some questions to consider. Will you interact with the public? Uh, the standard commercial general liability insurance. Uh, what kind of group will you sell? Should be thinking about product liability insurance. Uh, will you rent or own a building? You want to think about property insurance. Uh, will you use vehicles uh, for the course of your business? You want to think about vehicle insurance. And will you have employees? This came up earlier. Uh, you don't need to. Con you don't want to consider it. You will have to have workers' compensation insurance. Um, so once again, the theme is that things happen. Um, make sure you have commercial general insurance. Commercial general liability insurance. I'm just going to refer to it as general liability insurance. This is the standard uh, insurance that covers your assets, so things of value. 
and obligations that arise where there's injury on your property. Um, it's often called slip and fall insurance, so if, like a customer comes in and slips on a wrapper in your store, you'd be liable for um, their injuries and uh, the general liability insurance would cover that. Uh, I mean, it's very small. So it, uh, the, the note here is it's especially important if you're going to be interacting with the public. It's pretty essential. So if you have a restaurant, a store, you have a stall, a food truck. And just keep in mind that, for example, restaurants are special um, general liability insurance is for restaurants that will cover specific things that would arise in your business, like if there's a power outage and everything on <coughs> the fridge goes bad, um, the general liability insurance should cover that. Um, so product liability insurance is often covered by the former slide, the general liability, um, but you always want to check with your insurance provider and make sure that you have proper coverage. If you're not interacting with the public at all, so the example of say you're selling um, candies online but you're not actually interacting with anyone, you still want to have um, product liability insurance. Um, the candy example probably would be the best because the chance of spoilage and someone being harmed from candy is very low, so you might not even need product liability insurance. But if you're shipping something that could actually spoil and, and cause food poisoning, you want to be covered by, um, you want to be covered with product liability insurance. Property insurance. This is often also covered by the general liability insurance, um, but you definitely want to uh, look into it, and if not, you want to get property insurance. So if you own a building, it's going to um, cover uh, losses to, uh, losses due to uh, equipment that's been damaged through fire, water, vandalism, other disastrous events, and um, you might want to purchase additional insurance to cover theft and earthquake. And if you're just a renter and you don't own the property, property insurance will still cover um, damage to the equipment that you own as well as improvements. So let's say you're putting an awning on um, to improve the storefront. Vehicle insurance. So this protects you from losses or accidents that, incur that happen in the course of using vehicles for your business. So there's any auto, which is a very broad coverage, and non-owned coverage. That would be where your employee owns the car, but the employee is using it as your agent in the course of business. You're going to need coverage if an accident arises. This would not be necessary if the person that's driving is an independent contractor, so not an employee or a volunteer who's your agent, but um, someone who's just their own personal business and, and um, providing their services to drive vehicles. Um, last but not least, workers' compensation insurance. So this is, in the state of California, if you have employees and you don't have workers' comp, um, you can be criminally liable. Um, so you need to have workers' compensation insurance, and you cannot make your employees pay for it. This is going to cover um, uh, injuries as well as possible, and a lot of times it covers lost wages. Um, this is not necessary for volunteers, but you can include them in your policy if you'd like. And of course, in exchange, for the benefits, the employee does give up his or her right to sue you in um, case of injury. All right, so this is sort of the recap of what we've just covered. And brings me to um, how can I save money? So I just listed a bunch of different types of insurance, and you might be overwhelmed by the cost that you think you're going to incur. So first, you want to balance risks and costs. This brings me back to the product liability slide. So say you ship candies, you're not, you might not even get that insurance in the first place. But if you do, you certainly would not purchase a very expensive policy to cover candies. Whereas if you're shipping you know, perishable baked goods, you would uh, purchase a more expensive policy to cover possible accidents. Shop around, talk to people who are in a similar industry, talk to different insurance brokers and agents. 
the policies really vary. You want to find one that's really finely tailored to your needs, but um, the cost will vary based on the insurer, so really shop around. If you're a nonprofit, you may be eligible for special rates. And this is, this doesn't seem like a huge deal, but just make sure your employees, your volunteers are constantly getting training. It's just the little things that help prevent injuries that can be very costly for you. Make sure you reassess your needs if your business changes or grows. And um, consider a business owner's policy, a BOP. Um, a lot of insurance carriers offer BOPs and they basically package a number of the different types of insurance. And as a bundle, it may cost you less than buying each one individually. And last but not least, um, ask your volunteers to sign a liability waiver simple, you can write it yourself, there are templates online um, so that it covers you in case something happens with your volunteers. And this was mentioned earlier, you could think about forming um, an entity that protects your personal assets, like a limited liability company, um, and hopefully um, as a cooperative, most ideally. Um, and with that, uh, I think that's the conclusion of our presentation segment. Oh, he said. <laughs>